DIA has a bit of a monopoly on the flying somewhere business around here, so it's in all our best interest that our airport isn't a hot mess. So you got years of unending construction inside that sends people this way and that. You got closed parking lots due to the shell driver staffing shortage. You know, they actually ran out of parking over the weekend. Then you got security lines backed up so long recently people are missing flights. Our Steve Steger looks at whether any of these problems are going to stick to an airport that is a major part of how Denver markets itself to the world. For the first time ever, our airport is the third busiest airport in the world. The world. We've never been close to that. And boy, those passengers are getting treated to something special. Construction at the airport has created a maze where the prize at the end is making your flight on time. This past weekend, they were telling people to avoid driving to the airport because they ran out of parking with two lots closed. And the security lines sometimes. Oof -da. And it's no doubt that we are going through a bit of a rough patch and it's difficult right now. Stacey Stegman speaks for DIA. She'll tell you some of the problems are just issues the rest of the world is facing right now, like a staffing shortage. But the other stuff, it's because DIA is growing. And I know that we've seen the good old days of the airport when everything was grand and gorgeous. We didn't have the passenger traffic that we had today, so we're having to adapt. The question is, will the growing pains impact the airport's brand? And when they get done with it, within 20 minutes, no one's going to remember the construction. Mike no, Boyd I mean, is a longtime airline industry for. analyst. Consumers, including moi, you know, we have the attention span of a rhesus monkey, you know, we go through here now and say it was terrible. Six months from now when it's done, we don't remember any of it. Boyd is a self-proclaimed critic of DIA. He told me Frederico Pena doesn't send him Christmas cards for some of the things he said about the airport over the years. But he says this short-term mess will be worth it. I would maintain it is hard to get around sometimes, trying to figure out where you are and where you're going and whatnot. But still, the fact is they're doing this because in two years we'll have an airport that the rest of the world will be coming to look at. And in the meantime, DIA is asking for something that's often in short supply during air travel. Patience. And all I can say to people is this is short term. We're going to make it better. We're going to fix the problems that we're experiencing. Stegman told me they are working as hard as they can right now to try to get people hired and get the airport running the way it ought to be. But this sudden demand is really crunching the airport that's already crippled by the construction. She says that they're also looking at changing the onboarding process for shuttle drivers to try to ease that parking problem. And in a few weeks, they expect to take down those temporary walls in the Great Hall as the phase one of this construction starts to kind of roll back and start the next phase, which will be a lot less invasive. I talked to Boyd, other analysts today, mm -hmm. who both said the same thing, that people just have this short-term memory, that... This will likely be something that we gripe about now, but in a few years we'll be like, hey, look at how nice the airport is. I suppose until the spaceport opens to passengers, <laughs> uh, <laughs> then we're just still going to be going to DIA. Yeah. But it, it's like any, it's like anything else. You build it for a certain time and place and a certain number of people, then times change and, and groups of people change. Yeah, think about it. A DIA is built for air transportation in the 1990s. It's 2020 now. It's an airport built for 50 million people they got 69 million in 2019, so they've got to make a much bigger airport to accommodate all those people, plus to change the way that we board flights. Think about it. You don't go to a ticket counter and get a ticket anymore. Yeah. Everything's on the cell phone, so they need all that space for ticket counters. They really don't. All right, we're going to fix the airport. We're going to get the hot cookies back on Frontier flights, and air travel will be good again. Thank you, Steve. For free, or for, do we have to pay for it? You're going to have to pay for the hot okay. cookies. Yeah. So Colorado is going to become the first state in America to require that the health insurance plans in its state marketplace cover gender affirming care like hormone therapy and reconstructive surgery. Starting in 2023, essential health benefits are also going to cover care related to addiction and mental health. The new benefits that are included in the benchmark plan fall into three buckets. First, uh, the first bucket are kind of benefits to fight the opioid crisis in the state. So we're increasing the ability for folks to get care to uh, for get coverage for things other than opioids. So things like acupuncture, things like other prescription drugs that are not that are not opioids. The second bucket um, is an increased mental health exam coverage for folks. So we have now in our benchmark plan. Uh, a 45 to 60 minute visit at least once a year that people are going to be able to get coverage for before they have to pay for any cost share. So co-payments or deductibles or anything along those lines. And then the last piece, the probably the biggest, not probably the biggest piece 
of the, the new benefits that are included are the, is the gender affirming care component that we that the administrator announced today. And that's really gender affirming care for transgender individuals to make sure that we have an equitable health care plan in Colorado. So those are the uh, changes in plans to state marketplace, not insurance people get through their employers. Division of Insurance says 500,000 to 600,000 Coloradans are enrolled in those state marketplace plans right now. It's about 15 to 20 percent of the population. So CU Boulder is working on the disconnect between people seeing warning signs of violence and then reporting warning signs of violence. I'm going to use a $1.2 million grant from the Department of Homeland Security to research, which can be a fine line between encouraging people to report and becoming a place that fosters fear of others or even hate. We want to develop information, educational programming about the warning signs for violence in ways that are informative, but also not provoking fear or perhaps targeting individuals who are from a particular race, ethnicity or background. We want to be really careful about how we message this information so that it's promoting safety and not creating discriminatory types of biases. CU's Boulder Center, the CU Boulder Center for Study and Prevention of Violence is working on this with CU Police. They're going to work on this both on and off campus. So it is fair to say that drawing up new political maps in our state is going to come off as unfair to someone. Question is, who is most unhappy? Democrats don't like the new congressional map. There have been concerns from the Latino community. Western Slope conservatives didn't like some versions. Colorado Supreme Court heard a variety of arguments today about why they should or should not sign off on the new congressional map. A day in court not exactly made for TV, but that's never stopped politics guy Marshall Zellinger. No plan can please everyone. This may be an understatement from the attorney representing the independent commission that drew this congressional district map. It creates four Democratic leaning districts, three Republican leaning and one toss up. Colorado Supreme Court justices have to either approve it or send it back to be redrawn with instructions on what the commission did wrong. I understand you disagree with the map, but where's an abuse of discretion here? Here are some of the questions the justices asked as they heard arguments from a half dozen groups on why the map needs to be redrawn. If we ended up disagreeing with you and agreeing with what some of your opponents are asking us to do, and we remanded this to the commission, how, how does it play out? It would be fairly chaotic if, if the end result of this was a back and forth that then went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. How are we supposed to think about that? One of the arguments made to the court was that the newly drawn Congressional District 8, the one that appears to be a toss up in the North Metro area, dilutes the vote of minorities. One of the Latino advocacy groups provided the court its proposed version of District 8. Instead of the dark shaded area, which is what the commission approved, it would include Broomfield and more of Adams and Weld County as a way to give the minority community a better shot at their candidate of choice winning. I would respectfully request that this court give no effect to the map, return it back to the commission with explicit directions to engage in the conversation on race. Some of the other arguments in today's hearing was that District 8 should be in the southern part of Colorado, which would require the justices to send it back to the commission. And Kyle, there was an interesting one from Denver that I know I referenced on Twitter last week was that there's going to be a precinct of 19 voters in Denver as a result of this redrawing. And they think that's unfair to those 19 people because you could perhaps know how those 19 people vote if you look down to the precinct level. So they came in while everyone else is arguing about race and diversity. They said this is unfair to 19 people because it gets rid of secrets perhaps that's kind of bonkers like if you're pretty sure like where your neighbors stand on an issue and then you watch the vote come down you're like Angela <laughs> a Angela really uh, question for you a uh, serious question because this is the first time that Colorado is going with this independent commission which is what the voters chose did you get any sense from the state Supreme Court justices that they'd be less likely to tinker with it because it's our first go yeah some of them made it clear like if we send it back to you as you heard in the piece like what happens then how do you see this playing out but they are part of the process and if they think that the commission ignored certain criteria that the voters said yes to whether the voters knew what the criteria was or not, mm -hmm. then they can send it back to the commission. It's tough for me to say because there's that argument like what if you disagree after that and then it gets sent to the federal court and then the U.S. Supreme Court and that's something the Colorado Supreme Court does not want. I really don't know which way it's going to fall. If this map gets upheld, we're going to send you out to that part of Denver with the 19 people so you can count yard signs and then we can check in with Angela, who's the tiebreaker. Thank you, Marshall.
the commission that's working on state legislative districts, like for the state legislature, is still working on uh, those maps. They have a state house plan, and it has more than enough solidly Democratic seats. The Democrats will continue to hold that chamber. The state Senate plan is still up in the air. Republicans are watching that closely because it's their best chance to flip and gain control of one half of the state legislature. It would still be a tough go with the maps that we've seen. The Senate map has to be decided on tonight. Then again, like the congressional map, it's on to the state Supreme Court for approval. The most Colorado thing we've seen today is the weather weathering in many weathery ways. More flair on there than a 1990s TGI Friday's waiter. Fire and ice and in other places, nice. Freeze warning for far northwest Colorado. Winter weather advisory, winter storm warning for parts of the western slope. Eastern plains, you get a tornado watch. Red flag warning, fire danger west of Pueblo, and high wind warnings for southern Colorado. Only reason we don't have a coastal flood watch is because we don't have a coast. It's low enough to be obvious. What's going on with Dillon Reservoir lately? Gasoline lawnmowers are rotten. The plan to pay Coloradans to phase out their gas mowers was so popular this summer, he ran out of cash. He saw a need, so he stepped up for his community time and time again. But a lot of times it's the Mr. Manzanadas in the world that do the heavy lifting. Today, the remembrance Fred Manzanares so richly deserved. Next. Dillon Reservoir is looking a little thirsty these days. Denver Water, which owns and runs that reservoir, says the water level in uh, Dillon is below normal right now, 83% full. Usually it's 95% full in October. Denver Water told us that some of the issue was a, a dry September, but then there were some construction projects that led them to lower the water level a bit. So if you're thinking it, it looks a little uh, parched, it is. Denver Water said Dillon still has a very good chance, in their words, of filling up next year. <laughs> tracking 
a powerful fall storm spinning over Colorado. The threat for severe weather on the eastern plains and more heavy snow in the high country. A mosaic of winter weather alerts cover Colorado and the Intermountain West. Advisories for wind, tornadoes, and accumulating snow. Denver waiting on rain. We've got a little thunder and lightning out on the eastern plains. It's all snow in the mountains and foothills above 9,000 feet. We could see anywhere from 4 to 8 inches of snow in the winter weather advisory over a foot in the winter storm warning area in the San Juan Mountains, and we're tracking severe weather on the eastern plains. Showers for Denver. We get a little bit of a break tomorrow and then another round of cold air, which could mean a rain snow mix here for the city on Thursday. Temperatures in the 40s throughout the evening with a bit of rain and coming up. We've got the first freeze with overnight low temperatures going below freezing. As we wrap up lawn mowing season in Colorado, the Regional Air Quality Council told us the program to swap out gas mowers for environmentally friendly options was so popular this past year, ran out of funding. State government's air quality planning group for the metro area has been offering $150 vouchers towards an electric or battery powered mower for people who turn in their gas mower. 15 year old program that was in serious demand this summer. We opened up our program for summer of 2021 and we ran out of money. We basically had um, $100,000, $120,000 worth of vouchers available to citizens, and um, those vouchers were gobbled up um, midway through the summer, and another 1,000 people uh, were in line for vouchers, and we simply couldn't fund them. The council gets its funding from local governments and also from settlement money when businesses are fined for air quality violations. They're figuring out their budget for next year's buybacks. It is going to happen next year. They'll start in May. Remember the absolute cluster that it was when Denver rolled out scooters and e-bikes? Well, Boulder is two months into its process, and at this point, zero reported crashes with injuries. Transportation planners gave Boulder City Council an update, said there have been some complaints scooters can be left anywhere, you know, instead of going into a docking system. Uh, E-bikes are the far more popular option in Boulder. Since August, Boulder's logged almost 70,000 e-bike rides compared to 23,000 scooter rides. He was a teacher and a leader in Colorado's Latino community. And people would always say to him, I know that voice. I know that voice. Where do I know that voice from? And that voice, remembering a life of significance through the eyes and hearts of people touched by Fred Manzanares. Next.
education and advocacy were always intertwined for Fred Manzanares. For the man from the mapped out of Garcia, Colorado, down along the New Mexico line, he saw learning as the path to a better life. Generations of students and neighbors are grateful for his insight. Today they gathered to remember the former Denver Public Schools teacher and administrator who died last year during the pandemic. Fred was a true educator. In 1948, became the second Hispanic person hired by the district. 37 years in Denver Public Schools. My name is Donald Manzanares. I am the son of Fred Manzanares. He taught uh, elementary, he taught middle, he taught high. It really set the stage for me to see that, you know, I could do anything I wanted to do. For him to be there and working with those kids, it, it was his life. My name is Steve Chavez, and I know Fred as being a former student of his back in the fourth grade at Greenlee Elementary School in Denver's West Side. So what he taught me was uh, perseverance and discipline, which was really important. When he uh, was working at Channel 6, teaching Spanish on TV for Denver Public Schools, that's where he really got his 15 minutes of fame. Everybody would always come up to him and always would repeat uh, phrases that he would say, uh, escuchan, he'd go like this, escuchan, listen. Freddie really was a father to me, a father figure, because he was a father for me away from my father in California. He had an ability um, to just love people, and he loved his students. My father passed away at age 97, two months shy of 98. But a lot of times it's the Mr. Manzanares in the world that do the heavy lifting with children. It's just a wonderful legacy that he gave back to his community over and over and over again and asked nothing in return. Our thanks to Fred's family, friends, and former students for sharing their memories with our photojournalist Byron Reed. Your feedback tonight covers a number of topics, chief among them, what was going on with those dinging noises earlier in the show? Found an answer next.
Tom Delgado just emailed in, said Fred Manzanares was my teacher in high school. He was very exact in his expectations, held me to a high standard. Tom writes, never got to say thank you. Craig and Keith, along with Blue on Twitter, were all curious about the bell tones, the chimes that kept going off early in the program. I apologize, I couldn't hear them, otherwise I would have said something about it. It was an errant weather alert. We've taken the malfunctioning equipment out of service and thrown it from a fifth floor window. It's a joke. Building's only two stories. We threw it from two stories high. We'll make sure that it's destroyed. Christy says uh, she's a Frontier flight attendant and they took out the ovens for the cookies, which is also where they would reheat their lunches. She says the lunches are missed, the cookies are not. 